Welcome to the Servants of Grace podcast hosted by Dave Jenkins. Our podcast exists to provide trustworthy expository messages through the Bible and faithful answers to your theology questions. Now for today's episode, let's join our host, Dave Jenkins. Well, welcome to our time of study in God's Word. My name is Dave, and I'm the host for this show. And today we're going to continue our study through the book of Psalms, looking today at Psalm 15 and the ultimate question. Would you please join me now in prayer? Father, we come to your Word, and we believe that your Word is reliable, that it's trustworthy, that it speaks to the issues of our heart and to the issues of our day that are of perennial importance because you help us to know the way in which we are to go in your word. And you have answered the ultimate question in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. So Lord, as we come to look at this great text today, I pray that you would use it to open our eyes, to open our ears, and to hear what you would have to say to us now through this text, by your word, in Jesus' precious name, amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them to Psalm 15. Go ahead and open your Bibles to Psalm 15. And hear what the word of the Lord has to say to us today. O Lord, who shall sojourn in your tent, who shall dwell on your holy hill, he who walks blamelessly and does what is right and speaks truth in his heart, who does not slander with his tongue and does no evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friend in whose eyes a vile person is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord, who swears to his own hurt and does not change, who does not put out his money at interest and does not take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things shall never be moved. I don't know about you, but when I was young, I I, I thought I knew all the answers. Well, as I quickly learned, I, I knew many of the answers. I'm now almost 42. I'll be 42, well, in about six months, but I'm rounding the corner to to 42, and I think I have a few more answers than when I was 19 years old. You know, as we get older, we learn what what is most important. We learn to write, to ask the right questions. The right answer to the wrong question is the wrong answer. And so asking the right question, it makes all the difference in the world. If if you're hiring somebody, you need to ask them about their experience, their background, and so on and so forth. If if you're helping your parents transition to a retirement home, you need to ask the director of the facility the right questions. If you have a good friend, they ask you good questions to draw out good answers from you. If you want to know where you're supposed to go to college, you need to ask why you're going to college and what kind of degree, what kind of education, and what is the goal of you going to school. If you're falling in love and you're thinking about marriage to you know, if you're a guy to a gal, and a, if you're a gal to a guy, your parents and your friends will help you to ask the right questions. Asking the right questions is the key part of wisdom. Of all the right questions to ask, Psalm 15 verse 1 is the most important. When the psalmist says, O Lord, who shall sojourn in your tent? who shall dwell on your holy hill? That's the ultimate question. Who can dwell in the presence of God? Who is qualified to stand before him? Who can know him face to face now and forevermore? Who can go to heaven? 
Now, we need to understand that David is, is not asking a superficial question about who may enter Jerusalem or who may worship in the tabernacle. The words sojourn and dwell in verse 1 point more than a visit to the tabernacle. A sojourn is a resident alien. And so, so Abraham sojourned in the promised land. Israel sojourned in Egypt for 400 years. It's hard to imagine that a pilgrim would ask to sojourn in God's tent. When they visited Jerusalem, the tabernacle was the dwelling place of God. But David is asking a larger question than any of those things. What kind of people can live in the presence of God? In Psalm 14, 5, we saw that although all humanity is ruined by sin, God has reserved for himself the generation of the righteous. And Psalm 15 is going to tell us who the righteous are, who the people of God are. Psalm 15 describes God's righteous people. Is there a, a more important question to ask today? After all, if you ask a dozen people on the road, what is salvation? They're going to give you a dozen different answers. Some, and, and basically, those answers are all going to boil down to one fundamental answer. They all think that they can get to heaven because of their good works. Because they deserve it. Because they did good things. And so, is there any more important question to ask than the one that we're doing so now? And to be clear, this is more important than asking how you're going to pay for your mortgage, your retirement. This is more important than you'll date or even who you will marry. This is more important than, than where you're going to go to school, what you're going to do with your life. In a hundred years, those questions will not matter anymore because you'll be in the grave. But this question that we're considering today in our time together, it's going to echo for all eternity. Who can live with God in his heaven? That really is the ultimate question. In fact, the ultimate question, it requires the ultimate answer. And in the rest of the psalm, David speaks for God as a prophet in answering his opening question. In verses 2 through 5, it lays out the 11 requirements for anyone who wants to live with God in heaven. And these, these answers are structured in parallel forms so that we have to read them with each other and not as independent tasks to be done. And taken together, these give us a full-orbed view of life and godliness. And now notice that not one of the qualifications in this list is religious. Ceremonies and sacrifices are not the answer. These requirements are more penetrating because they have to do with our everyday lives. They're not about what we do on Sunday. These qualifications are about what we do during the week. God's people are known by the way that they live when they're not at church. You know, after all, we're sent out on mission by God every Sunday after the pastor or one of the elders prays and releases us from the service. We're sent out on mission. We're not sent to holy huddles. We're not sent to, to give each other hugs and, you know, uh, those type of things, although, although we are we are to encourage one another. We are to bear each other's burdens, as Galatians 6, 1 through 2 says. And we're commanded to do that. But it matters how you do your work. It matters how you, it matters how you love your spouse. It matters how you love your neighbors. It, it matters. Because it shows not just that it shows a transformed heart. It shows that you really belong to Christ and other people can see that. After all, Jesus told us that we were to be salt and light in Matthew 5, 10 through 12, and, and that we would be a city set on a hill. As we go out, we are a people set apart by God in the world to reflect the glory of Christ and the grace of God to the world. That's why we've been sent out to make disciples 
who make disciples wherever the Lord has planted us for his glory. So the the qualifications, they fall into four main categories. They're personal, they're relational, their heart, and their money. So first, personal. God's answer begins with the personal character of the man or the woman who can live in the presence of God. And as the first set of qualification, this verse is the starting point of all others. In fact, some people think that verse 2 is the answer and the rest of the psalm simply fills out verse 2 in more detail. Verse 2 says, He who walks blamelessly and does what is right and speaks truth in his heart. God's point to three aspects of a man or a woman's character are given here. First, he walks blamelessly. Verse 2, our lifestyle has pride of place in his first qualification. And the word blamelessly doesn't mean sinless perfection. It carries a sense of wholeness, honesty, integrity. This means that we are the real deal. We consistently walk in the way of the Lord because what he is on the outside comes from who we are on the inside. We are a whole body. We are holy. And in the Bible, Noah says, is, is, is described this way in Genesis 6, 9, blameless in his generation. In Genesis 17, 1, God told Abraham to walk before me and be blameless. And so a lifestyle of integrity is one of the defining marks of the great women and men of the Old Testament and of the Bible. Being blameless means that we walk with God on the inside where only he can see. Now, some of us are immediately offended by that. We're like, wait a minute, I don't want God to be on the inside. I don't want God to be that close to me. But guess what? He's the one that owns us. At at the moment of our salvation, he comes, the Holy Spirit does, and it dwells us. The Holy Spirit is not only alongside of us. He's not only behind us. He's not only before us and everywhere. He's also indwelling us. So, yes, the Holy Spirit sees us. This is why this is why Hebrews 4:12 says that the word of God pierces our hearts. Why? Because the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. This is why Paul can tell the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians that they are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So it matters. It matters how we're walking with the Lord. After all, road engineers will sometimes take a coarse sample of an asphalt road to see what lies below the surface. And with that core laid out on a workbench, the engineer can see the the quality of the materials all the way through the pavement. What would a a coarse sample of our hearts show? If somebody was to take a video camera even and, and follow us around, what would be the evidence to those who would watch that tape play What would be the evidence that they would have that you have a transformed heart? What would they see? Would they see you loving your kids? Would they see you loving your spouse? Would they see you loving others? Or would they see you maybe how you really are? Would they see your language? Would they see your, you know, your how you use your phone and on and on? Imagine if that camera was on you all the time. And that it was playing all the time and you could never stop it. And that one day you're going to stand and give an account for all the things that you thought that you were doing in secret and in public. And friends, that's exactly what's going to happen. We are going to give an account, the Bible says, for every idle word. That means that we will be held accountable. And what would that, what is going to show at that time? Are we solid on the surface, but are we really crumbling on the inside where nobody can supposedly see? A blameless Christian is a person of integrity. The second personal quality of this is that the psalmist gives us is they does do what is right. And this shifts the focus more specifically to our action. The the righteous person does what is right. They they live up to the standard that God has set in his word. In 1929, Marion Wade started Service Master as a moth-proofing company. 
In 1947, he branched out into carpet cleaning with his partners. Service Master has become a Fortune 1000 company, and maybe more, with, with almost 60,000 corporate and franchise employees, one of the largest privately held companies in the world. Marion Wade was a committed Christian, known for his personal integrity and character, and his values shaped his company. And one of his sayings has, is, is important. If you don't live it, you don't believe it. Or, as my mom used to say, actions speak louder than words. And no matter what we say, we will always do what we really believe. And this is why, this is why even the stronger thing to say is what James does. Be doers of the word. It, it is far more important to understand what James says in James 1.22 than it is to understand what my mom said or even what Marion Wade said. Because of the implanted word, which James talks about earlier in James 1, the word, that implanted word is gospel. The gospel is revealed in the word of God. The gospel gives us a new heart with new desires and new affections for the glory of God. And it's because of this that we can do, by the grace of God, with the help of the Holy Spirit, who indwells us. And this is what we're getting at here in verse 2. Does what is right. His action shows what he believes in his heart. In fact, James, the brother of our Lord Jesus, describes the same connection between what we do and what we truly believe in James 2, 14 through 17, saying this, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says that he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? And so also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. God is looking for actions to back up our words. And the third qualification given in verse 2 is that he speaks truth in his heart. Now we just... We just talked about in Psalm 14, how last week, that the fool says in his heart, there is no God. But you see, the godly person, it, it doesn't, he doesn't lie to them. They don't lie to themselves. They don't push down. They don't suppress the truth. The godly person tells them the truth themselves, the truth about God. In his classic book, uh, Spiritual Depression, Martin Lloyd-Jones tells us that, that we're supposed to tell us, ourselves the truth about God about ourselves, about his character. And we're supposed to tell it to ourselves over and over and over again. And what this does is it helps us to stop being deceived by carefully reading the scriptures, by, by lining and thinking uh, or having our thinking shaped by the word of God so that we have the courage to change our minds when we have ideas that do not line up with the Bible. The godly person speaks the truth to others. They don't allow a critical spirit to blind them, and they speak the truth in their heart about themselves. We don't flatter, they don't flatter themselves and become conceited, and they don't run themselves down and get depressed, they're balanced. And so we can summarize these three personal qualities with three words, integrity, activity, in honesty, together they represent the personal, individual character that God requires. Next, let's talk about relationship. As a prophet speaking for God, David moves to the next category, the second category, the godly man or woman's relationships. Verse 3, who does not slander with his tongue and does no evil to his neighbor, nor takes up reproach against his friend. Now, the qualifications in verse 3, they are horizontal. They focus on my dealing with my, in my relationship with others. All three of these qualifications, they're negative. They describe what not to do. In fact, these negative descriptions are specific applications of the positive command in Leviticus 19.18, which says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You see, the godly, they don't slander others. The word for slander means to spy, and by extension, to backpipe or slander. Like spying, slander is not out in the open. It means saying bad things about others are bound their back. Now, we also need to say something about this. 
Because the internet is a place where slander lives. It thrives. You can be what I call a keyboard ninja. You can just say whatever you want to say about whoever. I just had a friend this week experience this. This person posted a long rant about this particular friend of mine. And they're a very good friend of mine. In fact, they're a family friend of my wife and I's. And you know what? There was no evidence. Just general assumptions, general statements, no specifics about how this person, how my friends sin. That's slander. That's not loving. See, the church is no place for friendly fire casualties. James 4.11 says, Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. Gossip and slander have untold damage to fellow believers over the centuries. We even have enough trouble from a sinful world to waste our time telling each other what is wrong with a fellow believer. See, slander focuses on people's warts and pimples, but love covers a multitude of sins, 1 Peter 4, 8. And with the fifth qualification, David expands from damaging words to damage in general. He does no evil to his neighbor in verse 3. There's a natural progression from evil words to evil actions. Who's my neighbor? Well, Jesus answered this in the parable of the Good Samaritan. Your neighbor is whoever you come in contact with throughout the day. And when we consider the, the national evil of abortion on demand, which is still a real thing even in our day in a post-war row world, a pregnant woman's closest neighbor is the little one she is carrying in her womb. This unborn baby is a unique human being who depends on her for everything. How terrible is it to do evil to that neighbor? How terrible for a doctor to welcome this mother into the clinic and harm that little neighbor in her womb? We protect our neighbor in lesser ways, too. A woman should not have to worry about leaving her purse in her shopping cart because you're around. Your boss should not feel like they have to watch his back because of it. Your employees should not worry that you're going to take advantage of them. People should not worry about what we will do when they leave for vacation. Instead, the opposite should be true. And the sixth qualification is that they do not take up a reproach upon his friend. They're loyal. They do not betray friends. Friendship and loyalty are important in the Psalms, and they're important to God. In fact, one of the deepest pains Christ endured was his betrayal by Judas. David spoke about this in Psalm 55, 12 through 13. For it's not an enemy who taunts me, then I could bear it. It is not an adversary who deals insolently with me, but then I could hide from him. But it is you, a man, my equal, my companion, my familiar friend. The people God welcomes as his own are loyal to their friends. We need to honor the relationships, the friendships that God has given us. Next, let's consider the third category, which has to do with our hearts. Verse 4 of Psalm 15 says this, In whose eyes a vile person is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord, who swear to his own heart and does not change. All 11 of these qualifications of this psalm, they're all tied to one another, but the seventh and the eighth ones are particularly close. Despising a vile person, honoring those who fear the Lord, are two sides of the same coin. It means loving what God loves and hating what God hates. The vile person, in verse 4, is literally a rejected person. And we can take this to mean that that person has been rejected by God. And when a per godly person, a godly man or a woman, despises a vile person, their feelings and their attitude are aligned with God's. They agree with God's emotion, evaluation on an emotional level. And they are thinking God's thoughts after him and feeling God's feelings after him. Psalm 139, 21 through 22 says this, Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. You see, a key aspect of godliness is to hate sin and to be revulsed by evil. And this is why James says in James 4.4, 4, friendship with the world is enmity with God. A godly man does not laugh with someone who tells off-color jokes. A godly person does not look up to a man who boasts and swaggers. They think they're all that in a bucket of 
you know, cold water and all that, and they, they go on and on about themselves. Instead, we love the way that God loves. And we need to say, if your heart is aligned with God's heart, you're going to honor those who honor the Lord. If you want to know the soil bed of someone's heart, notice who they admire. Notice who they follow. Be careful with your heroes. Your affections will tell whether your heart is aligned with God. If you love the Lord, you will love what he loves. If you love the world, the love of the Father, 1 John 2.15 says, is not in you. In fact, the ninth qualification expands on, on the godly man or woman's heart. In verse 4 of Psalm 15, it says, who swears to his own hurt and does not change. This means keeping our word even if it is. It's going to damage our reputation. No one has a problem keeping his word when he, he has benefits. But, but how about, you know, when, when there's a thing on a bill, you know, and the, and the waiter, waiter or waitress forgets to add that. What's your instinct? When you're, when you're at the coffee shop and, and you know what? You're not charged the right price or you think that you're not charged the right price. What's your first instinct? To forget about it. To say nothing, I can tell you the right instinct. The right instinct is to say something. To say something. Even if it's awkward, because that's integrity. No one has a problem keeping their word when they benefit. But how about when things have changed and you're going to take a loss, or you're going to lose money, or you're going to spend money that that you, you, you didn't want to spend? This is the test of integrity does your word mean anything? The godly keep their word no matter what. The fourth category has to do with money. Psalm 15 verse 5 says, Who does not put out his money at interest and does not take a bribe against the innocent. These 10 and 11th qualifications have to do with materialism and the love of money. These are classic, quote-unquote, respectable American sins. But the godly, for the godly, people are more important than money. And some people have taken the first part of this verse to mean that Christians should never charge interest. That's not what David's meaning. In the law of Moses, God forbids interest among the Israelites, especially among the poor, in Exodus 22, 25, and Leviticus 25, 35 through 37, which says, If you lend money to any of my people with whom you is poor, you shall not be like a money lender to him, and you shall not exact interest from him. You see, those who needed loans were in distress. This wasn't consumer lending. They, they weren't borrowing for a new iPhone or an iPad or a new laptop or on and on in that context. They were borrowing because the crops failed and their clan was desperate. The rich were not to take advantage of their fellow Israelites when they were over a barrel and had to borrow money. The law of Moses does allow charging interest from Gentiles. Deuteronomy 23, 20 says, You may charge a foreigner interest, but you may not charge your brother interest. And now, with that in mind, we can conclude that Psalm 15 is talking about financial dealings between Israelites and not about all lending in general. And we need to realize that this instruction was written in the law of Moses uh, with its tribal society and agrarian culture. The principle is that a godly man doesn't use the power of his money to take advantage of a fellow Israelite. He lends without charge to honor their relationship. He puts people before money. He puts people before money by not perverting the truth. He does not take a bribe against the innocent, verse 5. Taking bribes is not only an offense against the victim— it's an offense against the justice that perverts the courts. The godly cares where they get their money. You can't say to them that he didn't, they didn't see what they saw. You can't pay them to rule against the evidence, to return to the topic of abortion. You can't pay them to harm an innocent child. They won't perform an elective abortion to help fund their family's ski trip or pay off part of their loan for their house or a boat or on and on. They will not accept money at the expense of another person or the good of society. They put people before money. And David closes these qualifications with a promise. 
In verse 5, he who does these things shall never be moved because they're secure because they're in the presence of God. The God of Jacob is their fortress. Well, how we need to ask the question as we wrap up our time together now. How do you feel when you read these qualifications or you, or you hear them? As, as we read this psalm, our hearts should sink. My heart sinks because I know how far I fall from the fall short of these things. Do I walk blamelessly? Do I do what is right? Do I always speak the truth in my heart? You see, the Lord knows me inside and out. He knows my thoughts. He knows my deeds. In Psalm 143, verse 2, it says, Enter not into my into judgment with your servant, for no one living is righteous before you. If you and I are honest, we don't live up with Psalm 15. And we need to ask then, where does that leave us? And we're asking the right question, the most important question, but the answer is really horrific. None of us are the kind of people who qualify on our own merits or our own ability to live in the presence of God. But that also means there's good news because there's one in the Savior and Lord who came under the sentence of death, who lived a perfect life, obeying the Lord and the law of God revealed in the scriptures. And the only man, Jesus Christ, is the only man who ever lived a blameless life, who always did what is right, who spoke truth in his heart. First Peter 2.22 says, He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. He did no evil to his neighbors. They, he laid down his life for his enemies. He swore to obey the Father and did not change, even though it cost him his life. And he was not moved. He set his face towards the cross, Luke 9, 51 says, and has been exalted now to the right hand of God. Only Christ measures up. He was accepted by God on the basis of his blameless, sinless life. Psalm 15 begins a new section in the Psalms. And they focus on Jesus' welcome in the presence of God. In fact, much of Psalm 15 is repeated in Psalm 24, the end of this section. Together, Psalms 15 and 24 are like bookends for this section that deal with Christ in the presence of God. Psalm 15 introduces some of the key themes that run through this section, such as David's integrity, God's presence, the security of not being shaken. And so if you look through the following chapters, you're going to notice that these themes keep coming up again and again. And if we compare this with the previous sections, Psalm 3 through 14 teach us that Christ would be rejected by man, and Psalms 15 through 24 teach us that we would be accepted by God. This tension, rejected by man, accepted by God, is rooted in Psalm 2, 1 through 6. The nations rage against God's anointed, but God sent him as king on Zion, his holy hill. The structure of book 1 of the Psalms develops the reign and rule of God's anointed king that was introduced in Psalm 2. And where does that leave us today? What good is it to us if Jesus fulfilled this psalm and was accepted by God? We're asking here the most important question. Who can live in God's heaven? So far, we're still out in the cold. And yet the good news is that Jesus' perfect obedience and his sinless life can be credited to me and to you. Romans 15, 19 says, By the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. And again, in Galatians 2, 16, we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Christ. Jesus' full obedience as he lived up to Psalm 15 can be counted as yours. This, friends, is how we are made right with God. How can this happen? You must come to him and follow him as your Lord and Savior. Jesus said this in John 5, 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Today, I plead with you to repent and turn and trust in Christ alone. Psalm 15 is a bar that we can never meet. It's a standard that you and I can never meet. We can't jump high enough, but you know what? Jesus came into our world. He paid the penalty in our place and for our sin and rose again. His godly life, his sinless life can be counted as yours. And if you follow him, 
He will make you a blameless person. He will, and then, only on the basis of his imputed righteousness, will he welcome you into heaven. Friends, we have to be so clear about this today. We're living in a time when many people think that they can blend and mix. You know, think about it with me for a second. You, let's say you like to make a smoothie. I like to make a smoothie. When I make a smoothie, what do I do? Well, I get out the blender, right? I get out milk. I, I, I use plain Greek yogurt. I like to mix berries. And so what I do is I'll put in the, the yogurt first. Then I'll put in berries. And then I'll put in a little bit of, you know, milk. And then I'll blend it together. That's how you make a smoothie, right? Maybe you might put a little bit of sugar in, you know, depending on what you like. I like a little bit of extra sugar, okay? And I already know, for those of you that are ask, I know that the berries already have sugar, okay? I know. But the point is this. What we're seeing is people today, they treat life like a smoothie. Just dump everything, you know, you have their Christianity, but they want to have... They want to have their critical race theory. They want to have their Eastern mysticism. So they put in the Bible into that smoothie, and they put their critical race theory in the in there. They put their social justice into the smoothie. They put the Eastern mysticism in. They put their yoga in there. And on and on and it goes. And they blend it all together in, the, in that blender. And what you have when you do that, you have not Christianity. You have no Christianity. Because people today think that Christianity is one among many options. There's nothing that separates me from being a Christian and me believing in all those other things, in Buddha and Confucius and Gandhi and Freud and Marx and on and on and on. There's, there's nothing that separates it. Well, there's everything that separates it. All those world leaders, all those leaders of religions, all those philosophers, they're all dead. They're all gone. They do not exist anymore. They are in hell. A place of unrelenting, unending conscious punishment. Only Jesus Christ rose from the grave on the third day. Only Jesus Christ, who came under the census of death to pay the penalty that we justly deserve. Only he rose on the third day. Think about that for a minute. All of those world leaders, all of them, every single one of them, every single one of those great philosophers, every single one of those religious leaders, they're all gone and buried in the ground. Only Jesus Christ rose on the third day. And you know what's amazing? In the book of Acts, if they could have found, if, they, if, if, if the Jewish religious leaders could have found the body of Jesus, they would have discredited the whole entire gospel message. But they never found the body. This is why even secular Roman historians around the time of Jesus dying and afterwards, they wrote down that Jesus rose. See, the resurrection is not only a matter of biblical history, that is objective truth rooted in the word of God, but it is a matter of world history. And that is why all of history, from the beginning of time to the end of time and everywhere in between, it all centers on the King of glory, Jesus Christ himself. But it, we need to go a little bit further than this as well. Not only is what I said true, but it also means something. You are owned, first of all, every single person on this planet. And if there's any anybody else out there in the stars, they are owned by God too. He is the creator of everything. 
the one who creates. He's the one who sustains. He's the one who gives you breath. You're owned by him. You're owned by God. But here's also the thing. The one who can save you and the one who does save you from your sins, he owns you. You are, Paul would say, that you're a slave of Christ, a bondservant of Christ. That means that you're owned by virtue of your creator and your Lord and your king. And if you're not a Christian, there is coming a day when the creator of all and the king of glory, if you're not a Christian, there there is coming a day when, when the creator and king is going to come back and he is going to judge the living and the dead. And on that day, you're not going to be able to say to him when he opens up the books and, and he records for you, tells you all the deeds that you've ever done. You're not going to be able to tell him, you know what, you have no right to do this. You have no right to do this. You have no right to bar my entrance to heaven because you'll have no excuse. You might say, that's not fair. Remember, the one who creates is the one who gets to set the expectation. He sets the standard. This is why Christ, it's not a matter, the, the fairness argument fundamentally fails because what you and I, does, and, your, and people who argue that, what they fail to understand is that what we really deserve is to be left alone. They, they fail to understand that, that Jesus Christ didn't have to come. If if fair is fair, then guess what? The, let's take that. Let's take that, and I'll and I'll tell you this: Jesus didn't have to come. He didn't have to come to pay the penalty that we deserve and to die in our place and for our sin and to rise again on the third day. That's why the fairness argument it fails, friends. It fails. It fails to account for the depravity of the human heart as. As Jeremiah 17 says, human heart is wicked. It's wicked. It's deceitful above all things. And that is so important. If you do not understand the wickedness of the human heart, you can't even begin to grasp the glory of the grace of God. And if you don't believe me, this is why Paul spends so much time in the first three chapters of Romans talking about sin and the depravity of the human heart. It affects us relationally. It affects us socially. It affects us socially or sexually. It affects us morally. It affects us spiritually. It affects us in every way. That's why we're sinners by nature and by choice. And until you grasp that, You can't grasp the grace of God from which Christ came under the sentence of death in the incarnation. Born, virgin born, lived 33 years totally sinlessly. He was blameless before God. And he came in the incarnation to die as the Savior so that you would be reconciled to God, so that you could be adopted by God. You could be declared not guilty. You could become, you could have your sins washed as far away as the east is to the west. You could have no longer the wrath of God burning against you as an enemy of God, but instead become a friend of God. And you could be reconciled to God, redeemed by God, and then he could call other people to God. And your life, whole manner of life, because of the salvation that Christ purchased for you, would be totally different. Because what God does in salvation, he takes our heart of stone and replaces it with a new heart, with new desires and new affections for himself. And he gives us a new mission and a new purpose so that we will go out and we will tell other people about the glory of this king who alone can save. 
And friends, all around us, the, the harvest, as Jesus said, is the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Don't sit, dear Christian friend, on the sidelines. Go look at the Gospels. John, go look at John 4, for example. Jesus saves this woman at the well. And then when she's saved, what does she go do? She brings other people to Jesus. You may not be able to tell people the whole story if you're a new Christian. But you know what? You can bring, the point is you can bring somebody with you so that they can tell somebody about, that person can tell them about Jesus. Friends, you don't have to have a theology degree to tell somebody about Jesus. Can you tell them that, that Jesus came under the sentence of death to pay the penalty that, that you deserve and that he was buried and rose again? Can you do that? Then praise God, you can tell somebody about the gospel. That's what we need today. We who have tasted of the grace of God in Christ, we above all people should tell other people of the grace that we have tasted, that we have seen, and that we know that because it has transformed our lives. And we should go and tell others of this grace, of this mercy that's found only in Christ alone. And may we do so with urgency. May we do so boldly. May we do so rooted and grounded in the word of God. And may other people See, as we do, not only that, not only that we're urgent, not only that we're bold, not only that, that we say what we mean and mean what we say, but that our lives are transformed. And so they see both the message of the cross and the resurrection has truly taken hold in our hearts and is affecting and has trans is transforming our very lives. Let's pray. Father, we we thank you that your word is true. We thank you that your grace takes sinners who are dead in their trespasses and sins, as Paul says in Ephesians 2, and makes us alive together with Christ. By grace, we've been saved. And I pray, for, Lord, for those who have not yet been saved, that you would open eyes and ears as you did in Luke 24 with those people on the road to Emmaus. And that, that they would believe, and then they would go and tell others of the glory of Christ. So we thank you, Lord, that your word is true. And that as Isaiah 55, 11 says, it will not return without void. That you will take your word, that you will use it, and that you will, you will save and you will transform. And you will send out people from every tribe, tongue, nation, and people group. And that you will use them in the world for your glory and the good of people who do not yet know you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you for listening to the Servants of Grace podcast today. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, leave a rating on the app, and share our episode with your friends and family. If you'd like to, you can follow us on Instagram at Servants of Grace, on Twitter at Servants of Grace, or by searching Servants of Grace on Facebook. You can also find this podcast on the front page of our website at servantsofgrace.org.